Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of the iconic voices on behalf of the environment in India and in fact the world. He's the founder and director of the Energy Resources Institute and has served in numerous government committees in India as an advisor and, and numerous processes and discussions and, 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 and workshops with uh, international organizations and, and uh, institutions. He's lectured at universities in India and abroad. His list of formal commitments, affiliations and associations would be far too large to serve any introduction such as this. Uh, suffice to say, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. R.K. Pachori. You're this great voice, this great sort of passionate advocate uh, on behalf of the environment. Uh, you know, traditionally, the, the sort of the, the passion seems to be on, on, on the part of uh, you know, sort of NGO activists, people who don't have formal institutional governmental affiliations. You've managed to retain that passion despite these affiliations, which are usually perceived as being antithetical to the aspirations of the community. How have you managed this? Well, I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if that's an accurate description. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the voices that you hear on behalf of the environment and protection of the environment, uh, and as you say, these NGOs who are very vocal, I think they serve a purpose because they're able to attract attention to a subject which otherwise is liable to be ignored. Now, our approach as a research institution and my own personal uh, preference has been for looking at environmental issues in a much larger economic context. Because if you really want decisions, and if you want uh, to ensure that the welfare of the people is the objective that drives action or articulation of what needs to be done, then I think it's important to embed environmental decision making within economic decision making. Uh, now, I do realize that uh, this approach would fail. For instance, if you look at the loss of biodiversity, you really can't assign an economic value to the loss of 50 species. But I'm sort of interested in, at, at, at this point in the program, in, in Dr. R. K. Pachori, the human being, uh, behind this, this dimension of it. Uh, it, it. Do you feel sometimes sort of frustrated that this, this route, important and crucial uh, as it is, because ultimately perhaps uh, the, 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 the NGOs or the activists from the outside become pressure groups, but, but change will have to come from institutions such as the government, the World Bank and, and what have you, because that's the way the world happens to be organized, whether we like it or not. Uh, what happens to you, to, to you as, 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 as a human being when you come up against these sort of perhaps conflicts between personal convictions and, and, and public positions of, uh, of the institutions that you might work with, that be associated with? Yes, I think a number of them are bureaucracies that uh, by their very nature are impervious to change and uh, are not very sympathetic to change even when there's a strong logic behind it. So that does cause you frustration and at times it even causes you anger. But I think if you're committed to a way of thinking and a way of action, then I think you just persevere. And I find that even the most rigid of bureaucracies over a period of time, largely on account of a few good individuals who are somewhere in that mass of totally uh, faceless and uh, thoughtless persons very often, uh, will bring about change. And I think if you persevere, then over a period of time, and almost imperceptibly, you will see movement in the direction that you think is dictated by logic. Were there elements in your sort of per what are the elements in your personal history, perhaps, that led to the evolution of this this commitment, this passion uh, for the environment? After all, you did start this organization, uh, which is uh, has done very seminal work uh, in the area, despite its. Uh, you know, affiliations, I don't want to say despite, that's not a fair word, uh, but you know, it's, it's affiliated, it's supported by what is perceived as a, as, as, as a public spirited uh, commercial organization. Um, well, not but, really, and, not really. It, it has been, uh, been doing path breaking seminal work. Uh, what happened? How did this, this matrix emerge? Well, I mean, I was, um, I started my career as an engineer and I'm glad that I did because that certainly gave me an assessment and an appreciation of technology 
which I think is a very important component of any kind of change that is to take place in the modern world. And I joined this institution purely uh, as a fluke, I might say, because I had got to know Mr. Darbari Seth, who was the vice chairman, and Mr. J.R.D. Tata was the chairman at that time. Um, and I got to know him because I wanted some money out of Terry, <laughs> which was at that stage a small funding organization um, for a seminar or conference that I was organizing. I managed to get about 70,000 rupees from him. And in the course of that, I interacted with him. We got to like each other. And he asked me, he says, we're looking for a director for this institute because, you know, the Tata group provided about three and a half crores of rupees for establishing this institution. But to be quite honest, they really didn't have a clear idea of how it's going to function, what it's going to do. They had the best of motives behind it. And this, uh, when I say they, I am really talking about Mr. Darbari Set because he was the leading light. And he was the person who was really the person, who, he was really the person who, who created this entity. And I also took some steps on my own, which as a matter of fact, caused some conflict initially. Uh, the initial thinking on the part of Mr. Seth and everyone on the governing council was that I should be located in Mumbai. And I insisted because the institute was registered in Delhi. And I also felt that it's important to distance this organization from the uh, persons who provided the initial seed capital. Um, and I, I therefore started in Delhi without a roof over my head, without any infrastructure, but we built it up. And I dare say we have now got uh, this excellent facility in the India Habitat Center. Of which you were also the sort of the head. And, well, and you lead the organization. Fortuitous, <laughs> fortuitously. And you have, uh, you know, prime ministers and Nobel laureates and, you know, sort of uh, you're a personal friend of uh, Al Gore, of several, uh, you know, global leaders. So you really have carved out a very influential role. Uh, for uh, Terry. Well, we'll come uh, to more of that in a moment. You're watching a conversation uh, with uh, Dr. R.K. Pachori, uh, the sort of sane, sober activist voice for the environment. We'll be right back after a short break. You're watching a continuing conversation with Dr. R.K. Pachori. You were talking about um, when I sort of diverted you into a bit of your story uh, about um, the economic imperative. Uh, in, uh, in is issues related to the environment and, and how that is uh, so important. Uh, you've also spoken so eloquently about how uh, development uh, in India cannot afford the kind of ecological footprint that the West has. Um, is there a tangible, concrete hope that, that might actually happen? Uh, will we be able to assert the kind of restraint uh, and, the, and, and the costs that involves uh, in, 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 in the processes of uh, the political compulsions, the pressures to deliver? Well, I, I'd like to retain the hope uh, till the day I, <laughs> I die that that will happen. Um, and I think one means by which one can ensure that is to paint in stark terms the alternative. In other words, if we don't take these measures, if we don't go in a particular direction, what are we up against? we're up against a chaotic society, uh, a world where I think the impacts of uh, this totally senseless pursuit of more and more goods and services, personalized vehicular transportation, and everything that's glorified in Western society would lead us uh, to an end that clearly would be disruptive of the cohesiveness of society as it exists today, uh, but also in terms of uh, destroying those very support systems that provide sustenance and livelihoods to a large majority of our people. So I think what we really need to do is to carry out an objective assessment of what business as usual means. And if we are, we are to do that, as indeed we've been trying to do in the work of Terry, then we would find that that's really a no-brainer. 
You know, very often sort of civil society, uh, you know, wants, wants to look at, uh, at, at, at the buzz, at tangible, identifiable sort of cause and effect. And so you say, well, CNG in Delhi, and that has had a, a huge positive impact on the environment. But, but, but incidentally, you know, when, when, when the issue of CNG came up, there was a, a, a divide between what your organization suggested and, 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 and other organizations. Uh, so often, uh, the, you know, the agendas of, of the environment, you know, seem divisive in, 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 in some ways, though the larger goal is, is, sure. is presumably the same. Uh, what is, uh, is, is, is there a definitive scientific consensus uh, on, on, on several issues uh, such as these? Well, it's very difficult to arrive at a consensus. You know, if you look at CNG versus ultra low sulfur diesel. Now, the reason why we were advocating ultra low sulfur diesel is because Delhi is not all of India. If you really want to bring about change in the cities of India, then you've got to come up with a solution that's workable in other cities not merely the metros, but even the smaller towns where I might say the problems of air pollution are reaching levels and proportions that can be extremely harmful to human health and other economic uh, activities. Um, <clears throat> so our, our uh, position was based firstly on the fact that ultra-low sulfur diesel, which incidentally is used extensively throughout Europe, uh, gives you higher levels of efficiency of automobile uh, operation. The point I'm really making is that, uh, uh, or seeking uh, insight, is that, uh, you know, despite the empiricism of science, uh, you know, there are always so many conflicting points of view that add to the confusion. Uh, and, and I think that very often the media is responsible. So, you know, when the issue is raising the height uh, of the dam or not, it's, even, it's an environmental issue. But uh, perhaps, you know, the underlying issue at that time has happened recently with me, the Patkar Pass, uh, was one of rehabilitation, but that, that was lost. And we were only discussing whether the height should be raised by, you know, that many meters or not. Uh, is, 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 is a part of your uh, effort uh, to, to bring together, to, to, to create this kind of scientific consensus uh, so that it doesn't seem that there that, 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 that isn't apparent confusion, there isn't apparent divisiveness on yeah. what is really and truly needed. So in Delhi the issue really was that there is a problem with environment, whether we look at you know, your solution or someone else's solution is in a sense less important than uh, something substantive and positive needs to be done. Well, I think before people take emotional positions, uh, that has to be preceded by some objective analysis and very often you have a gap in terms of knowledge and when that exists then clearly emotion takes over and this is what we find in a range of decision making structures in this country and I think that's where it's critically important for us to that's where it's critically important for us to take a holistic view of any set of actions that is t being taken or is being contemplated now, when you do that, you're at least highlighting all the implications of decision A versus decision B. But often people take a very seg segmented view. And I might also say that, you know, science is not exact. You know, very often you're taking positions based on something that leaves a large amount of uncertainty. Now, given that fact, there could always be two viewpoints. That's why I think it's particularly important to have healthy debate. Unfortunately, in this country, People get very upset. They regard any questioning of a particular position as a questioning of personal uh, attributes or, or personal integrity. And somehow the debate becomes less than objective. So we need to create uh, conditions whereby, as in other developed societies, we can have healthy debates. We can have differences of, of opinion and then try to arrive at a consensus which people should accept because it's the process that is far more important than what you get at the end as a product. You know, the logic of uh, uh, capitalism really is that it's closer to an expression of human nature, uh, that you leave people free and, 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 and ever-increasing amounts of consumption, uh, of, 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 of the happiness, physical fulfillment, uh, sensory pleasure doctrine uh, is fulfilled through that and it, it keeps escalating. Um, whereas uh, a, a great deal of um, the, the positions that uh, environmentalists take 
you know, Gandhi is, is, is always quoted need and greed and, and, and what have you. So in a sense that, you know, quite apart from legislation and policy, uh, do you sometimes see yourself as working against what is perceived, even if erroneously, to be human nature? Well, you see, I'm strongly in favor of free markets, but I think one has to look at the externalities that free market actions impose on some sections of society. I mean, if, I, if I'm running a car which is spewing out huge quantities of harmful pollutants and that's having an impact on somebody else, well, I have no right to do that. So I think this is where it's extremely important for us to assess what these externalities are. And wherever there are negative externalities, then the person has to accept the principle of the polluter must pay. So uh, I, I think that's where we fail. This is really a case of market failure. And this is where I think public policy has to step in through regulation, through taxes, through fiscal measures. You somehow have to ensure that the burden of what your actions are imposing on somebody else are borne by you to the extent that's necessary. But the, the, the implicit logic in that of, of, of the polluter must pay is that if you can afford to pay, as, as, as the Western world is in a sense doing and, and, and saying, uh, that uh, you know, because we can afford to pay, we can get away with it. No, they, they, they are not paying for it. You see, take the case of climate change. It's been caused largely by the developed countries because the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide being the most prominent, has reached a level where it's having impacts on the rest of the world. But many of the solutions that are being suggested uh, of you know, environmental credits and, and what have you is, is implicitly... Uh, but that's just scratching the surface. I mean, it really doesn't get to the root of the problem. And I think one has also to accept the fact that in this day and age when information flows are so rapid and so extensive, that we also have to be concerned about the issue of equity. You know, any system which causes an increase in, uh, in, in disparities is certainly not a desirable system. Kenneth Boulding, an economist who I admire greatly and a person who was ahead of his time, said very clearly that I doubt if 200 years ago the average income between the richest and the poorest nations in the world was more than 1 is to 5. Today it is more than 1 is to 50. So you see, we have a system which is really going to divide society. And I'm concerned about the fact that in India, there are people who are totally insensitive to uh, the, the plight of the poor. I mean, I have nothing against accumulating wealth, income, all the good things in life. But certainly, you have to be sensitive to the needs of the poor. And each one of us must try to do a little bit to see that, you know, what Gandhiji talked about as Antode is, is, is kept clearly in focus. So I, I think it's not merely a question of the externalities that we are imposing on, on others, but also a system which is only causing wider disparities. And therefore, I, I believe that we need to contemplate on uh, the kind of path that we are taking and whether that's only going to create further divisions in society, the cost of which all of us will pay. I mean, if there's street crime, if there's murder, if there's rape all around, as you see happening today, if people can kill someone in full view of 200 people and get away, then we're all paying a price for it. But do you really significantly imagine, feel that, 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 that something concrete is happening or are we merely just beginning to sort of slow the pace of acceleration uh, in, 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 in the damage that's happening to the environment and, 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 and our common welfare. Well, I think you're right. This is a start. We are perhaps slowing down the rate of damage that would otherwise have taken place. But what gives me a great deal of uh, optimism is the attitude of youngsters today. They are getting far more sensitive about environmental issues and they also prepared to take action and perhaps induce their parents to take actions that would be environmentally sensible. Uh, but we have a long way to go. There's but no question it, but about is, it. it. Do, you, do, you, do, you, do you derive some satisfaction of, 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 of a long um, uh, association with the cause and a long passion for the cause that it's, it's growing into something more substantive than a fashion? 
Well, it, it, really speaking, uh, one, can, uh, one can say yes, in some areas it's merely a fashion. But in other areas you do see, I would say even the fact that we've had so much of discussion, so much of debate on, uh, let's say, the rehabilitation of the Austies uh, as pa part of the Narmada uh, set of projects uh, is a sign that these are issues that have now come to the fore. And the fact that, you know, people can't blindly go ahead and construct high dams wherever they want uh, is, is an example of concrete action. Uh, what's happened in Delhi uh, <clears throat> with air quality, and it was a series of measures, CNG was one of them. I would say even the construction of flyovers, the fact that all the old buses were sent out of Delhi by an order of the Supreme Court, the introduction of Euro 2 standards in manufacture of automobiles, the move from two-stroke to four-stroke engines in two and three wheelers. I mean, all of this is a set of concrete actions. There is a perceptible increase in green cover in some of the forest areas of this country, which I think is also heartening. Not enough, a long way to go, but certainly a step in the right direction. The ultimate impetus, I suppose, for, for, for action uh, comes when uh, we begin to feel personally uh, threatened and personally affected. Um, in, in terms of sort of, you know, the lifetime of say, you know, 15, 20 year old and the young people you're talking about, what is the most frightening worst case scenario that you could say to them, look, if you don't act, uh, this is what's going to happen during your lifetime? Well, climate change. You see, we already have rapid melting of the glaciers in the Himalayas. Uh, sea level rise is becoming a threat. Water scarcity is going to grow. Extreme weather events floods, So south. this is 30, 40 years, or this 50 years, 60 years, whatever, that this young person might live. What are the kind of things that he might see or she might see uh, if, uh, you know, dramatic and sufficient intervention hasn't taken place? Severe water stress all over the country, several parts of the country. Uh, so great difficulty in providing water even for drinking purposes. Uh, harmful impacts on agriculture and increase in vector-borne diseases. Uh, coastal areas being threatened by sea level rise or God forbid if you have another tsunami of the type that we had a year and a half ago and you had a sea level which was a foot higher then clearly the devastation would be much worse. So there's a whole range of things. Here now me, uh, this is still, you know, we still feel, you know, the, the elites, people who watch television uh, feel that it's still out there, you know, the tsunami happened somewhere else, we saw these, saw these images, uh, the glaciers are melting. Uh, in, in, in terms of people's everyday experience. Well, you see, that's the pity of it. I think as an intelligent society, we have to be driven by science and by logic. Because unfortunately, you'll never see that uh, smoking gun. I mean, you'll never find uh, such incontrovertible evidence that something terrible is happening. Because by the time you find out, it'll be too late. It would have happened anyway. So I think this is where we have to appeal to the logic, the understanding, the knowledge of people who shape and form decisions. And I think if we can do that, people will realize. And I believe all over the world there is now a movement. And I think it's just a matter of time before people in this country also start getting sensitive and active on some of these counts. In terms of sort of uh, uh, time frames for, for, for concrete actions and initi initiatives, sort of the next phase perhaps uh, that you would like to see happen in the next two, three, five years in, in, in predictable uh, uh, f f frames of reference, what would you like to see happen um, on the issue, uh, particularly as, 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 as a consequence of some of the initiatives and areas that you're working on and, and you're exploring and, 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 and and engaging in, in such vigorous activism for? Well, two things which seem very simple. One is better sanitation in this country. I haven't heard any single leader of consequence making this his lifelong passion that, you know, you shouldn't have people defecating wherever they want. You should have every community well equipped with uh, sewage treatment facilities and you should ensure that all that sewage is not dumped into our rivers. And the second thing that I'd like to see is cleaning up of our rivers, riverways and waterways because unfortunately this is such a crime against humanity. I mean all the river systems in this country are dead. There's no fish, 
you can't go there to bathe, leave alone drinking water. I mean, uh, you can't even bathe over there. Uh, so w what are these worth? I mean, these are supposed to be areas of beauty. They're supposed to give you recreation. They're supposed to give you pleasure. And they're supposed to give you livelihoods and sustenance. What have we done to that? Perhaps we could sort of uh, end uh, where we started with, with Dr. R. K. Pachori uh, and, 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 and your interest in, in, in engaging in issues related to the environment so passionately. Uh, what has this process done for you uh, as a human being? Well, I get a sense of... changed by this in some ways? Because, you know, obviously, uh, when you look at issues of the environment, it's related to feelings of interconnectedness. There is a quality of the spiritual to it. There are many dimensions. It's, you know, it's... You know, if you're involved in something, it just re-energizes you every moment, every minute of the day. And I find that I start my day thinking of all the things I have to do. And I end my day saying, oh my God, I haven't done even half of them. But then I look forward to the next one. And um, it's given me a purpose in life. It gives, it gives, it's given me fun. And if I didn't have this fun, I'd probably have no energy to do anything that uh, I might enjoy doing. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for everything around me. I'm grateful for the colleagues I have in my institute and friends and associates all over the world. It's, it's a wonderful... But there is, this, is there something sort of special that working on, 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 on this particular issue uh, does for you? Because this would happen, uh, you know, I guess for, for someone who was a corporate um, the honcho who was, you know, busy demolish, destroying the environment to make more money and, and fly and fly in faster aircraft. Um, uh, you know, you radiate a, a tremendous sense of, uh, of joy, of, of, of laughter, of you know, other qualities. So I was just sort of wondering if, if in, in, in terms of how you view yourself over years of working in, in, in this field, how it has affected you. Well, I, I think it just uh, gives me something to look towards in the future. It gives me the ability to look around me. If I was just looking, let's say, suppose I was the CEO of a company, was only looking or largely looking at uh, the bottom line over the next quarter, uh, I'm not too sure it would give me this sort of uh, enormous universal sense of joy and belonging and, and a sense of purpose uh, that in a way connects me with everything in the universe. Now, this may be an illusion. But if it's an illusion that's good for me, I'm all for it. Well, thank you, Dr. Pachari, for, for radiating this and sharing this with us. Thank this has been a great pleasure, sir. A great much. honor, sir. Thank you.